cameos give us a chance to enjoy a character, thing, or person in a place where we don't normally expect to see them. Like, what's Rob from PlayStation Access doing here? <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Which is fine most of the time, and when we do it, but not when those cameos make absolutely no sense, exploding the internal logic of our favourite games like a wedding cake full of firecrackers. Seriously, Soul Calibur, how are we supposed to take your rich backstory seriously now that this is part of your fictional universe, eh? Here are the cameos in games that must be declared immediately non-canon, for the sake of our sanity. Along the way, beware spoilers for the following. Have they sent a message from the sky? It's as if Ra has descended upon us. With Assassin's Creed Origins focusing on the amazing gods of ancient Egypt, you might be forgiven for thinking that the quest A Gift from the Gods was about some animal-headed deity. But no, if you stumble across this free add-on quest, you'll find that an apparent fallen star has unearthed a tomb next to a rather unique sundial. Use the mysterious markings on the tomb door, solve the sundial's puzzle, and the curious stones within will go into overdrive. This freaks Bayek out just a little bit. Light shining up to the gods. Bayra, what have I done? Keep it together, Bayek. I mean, you're going to have to, as things are about to get a lot stranger. See, those lights have unlocked the tomb, and should you go in there, you'll set off one of the weirdest cameos of all time. Final Fantasy XV baddie, Ardin Azunia, appears and then gets carried off by a summoned Bahamut. It's a super short cameo, but long enough to completely challenge everything we thought we knew about the Assassin's Creed universe. Plus, before sweeping Ardyn away, Bahamut leaves you a gift or two in his Ultima sword attack. Noctis's engine blade, a Zedric shield, and the option of a brand new mount friend called Que. Oh, what a cute little chocobo camel thing. Look, it's so cute. I'm not even mad that it completely destroys Assassin's Creed canon. And plus, Quare is cute enough that really, really adds to my Senu selfies. <laughs> Your luck just ran out. Get ready. Fight! <laughs> The Dead or Alive series has a roster of weird and wonderful characters, but Dead or Alive 4 has a Halo cameo that is literally out of this world. Hey. What? She's from Mars. Yes, Dead or Alive 4 added Spartan 458, also known as Nicole. According to Backstory, Nicole finds herself stuck on the 21st century version of the Nassau station thanks to a slipstream space anomaly. She's in a unique position as a Spartan, being completely unable to kill anyone for fear of changing the future. Instead, she must hang around hoping that she'll eventually get back to 2552 and non-lethally incapacitate anyone in her way. <laughs> Ow! Wow! Wow, okay, well, incapacitate, not break every limb. They're not all covered in metal like you, Nicole. See, Nicole is fighting in her full Spartan gear, complete with all its abilities and extras, like plasma grenades. Plus, while it covers and protects her from head to toe, it doesn't hide the fact that she is 6 foot 8 inches, standing at 7 foot 2 in her half ton armour, so she's hugely tall, like all Spartans. This gives Spartans a natural advantage in combat, basketball, and seeing over the tops of other people's heads at gigs. Wouldn't that be nice? Hey, Ellen. I'm there for the atmosphere. Sure you are. However, Nicole was not a character originally in the Halo series, instead being designed by Bungie especially for this game and being referenced in Halo after her Dead or Alive appearance. This makes hers a unique cameo in the fact that it's a retroactive one. 
Just like how all my old family home videos feature my family, but also a cameo from super cool YouTuber Jane Douglas. Mario's never shied away from a sporting challenge and has, in his time, turned his not inconsiderable skills to football, golf, and he's even pretty handy with a jump rope. Uh, that's not really a sport. <laughs> Tell that to my year four classmates. Those fools got taken to school. Literally. But Nintendo's mascot isn't content with starring only in his own games. Enter NBA Street V3, a three-on-three -three basketball game from 2005 for Xbox, PS2 and GameCube. The defense, they just got on PS2 and Xbox, everything was relatively normal in this b-ball sim, but as part of a tie-up between EA and Nintendo, the GameCube version boasted significantly more moustaches and overalls, courtesy of the Nintendo All-Stars team. A cameo appearance for Mario, his brother Luigi, and divinely appointed ruler of the Mushroom Kingdom, Princess Peach. Well, I guess she is used to holding court. Whoa, too smart for the room? Basketball seems like a natural choice for characters who routinely jump more than twice their own body length, but sadly there was nothing natural about the proportions of Team Mario in the game, with a long-limbed Peach scaled to be roughly the height of her human opponents, while Mario and Luigi resembled swollen beasting victims. Still, can't ignore those sweet moves. Sure, it's all mad buckets now, but where were those sweet jumping skills in World 8-1 of New Super Mario Brothers, eh? Hey! Franco? Franco, what happened? Oh god. Isaac! Isaac Clark, if you can hear me, run! Run! Isaac Clark has a pretty stressful life, constantly nearly dying at the claws of horrible monsters. So you'd think after all that, he'd want a nice sit down. However, if this next cameo is a reflection of what he likes to do in his spare time, apparently Isaac prefers to kick flip rather than kick back. In Skate 3, if you head over into Free Play and enter in the cheat code Dead Space 2, you can unlock the legendary Isaac Clark as a character. This means that you could take this ship systems engineer and do some badass tricks, which is pretty impressive considering the getup he's in. That's a nice uh, woozle and a uh, nose kick, kick, tread flip, kick, woozle. yeah, kick flip woozle. I know skate stuff. Still, it's interesting to see Isaac just enjoy himself for once, only seeing him in pain because he failed to stick the landing, <laughs> rather than getting swiped at by nightmarish skeleton monsters. And it does beg the question, did his girlfriend Nicole know about his love of ollieing? He was a skater boy, she said, see you later boy. I'll be in space after the show, stamping on necromorphs, okay. killed by electric okay. doors, okay. it is quite bad, I'll have you know. I have more, I have more! The curtain has been raised. Those chosen by history begin their final battle. I will battle. destroy any that stand in my way. One thing there is that remains. We know that Master Yoda from Star Wars likes to keep secrets, like the fact that Leia is Luke's sister, or that the Force is all done with levers and pulleys. But even for Yoda, the fact that he's discovered a parallel universe is a pretty massive thing to keep under his hat, let alone the fact that he's travelled from his home on Dagobah into that parallel universe to take part in a magical fighting tournament. Stage start. <laughs> And yet, in Soul Calibur 4, that's exactly what's supposed to have happened, at least according to the explanation for why the diminutive former Jedi Grand Master is suddenly in a 16th century castle, waving a lightsaber at a man armed only with a wooden pole. Strange being, who are you? More important to know yourself. An unsatisfying answer, that is. To be fair, the Soul Calibur series has never been shy about freaky cameos, which is why Zelda fans must accept that Link at some point left Hyrule to destroy the evil Soul Edge, while Assassin's Creed enthusiasts try to fit this on-fire knight into the timeline of Ezio Auditore. 
but nothing beats Yoda's appearance in terms of pure fiction-breaking nonsense, even if there is some pleasure to be taken in seeing Kermit's less fun Muppet cousin dealing out lightsaber justice, taking advantage of the fact that he's often too small for his enemies to even hit. Ain't no Jedi code in the Soul Calibur universe. Go on, Yoda, kill, kill! Eventually, Yoda's thirst for smacking Reformation-era youngsters with a laser sword is sated, and he concludes his otherworldly jaunt by sucking all the energy out of the Soul series' two cursed swords. <laughs> then blasts off back to Dagobah in an escape pod, safe in the knowledge that he's accidentally placed the events of Star Wars firmly in the 16th century. Thanks for that, pointy ears. Still, it's better this than Darth Vader's Soul Calibur ending, which sees the heavy-breathing Sith Lord returning to a galaxy far, far away with a sword that has an eye in it, which is tough to square with the events of Return of the Jedi. I shall release your power now. Unless Vader put those swords in storage on the Death Star, then forgot about them, and then they get blown up, and that's why we never see them, and that makes sense, so yes, I can sleep again. The fictional continent of Tamriel has a history as rich as an over-honeyed sweet roll. Everywhere you look in Skyrim, which is merely one region of the sprawling Tamriel, you'll find evidence of the hours upon hours of thought that have been poured into the lore of the game. Every aspect of life in Tamriel has not only been considered, but charted in books or songs that can be found throughout the land if you have the time or inclination to read them, that is. So it's almost heroic that game maker Bethesda worked with Valve to jeopardise all that by introducing to Skyrim a talking robot from space. All right. But that is what happened in a promotional move to celebrate the launch of mod discovery tools for Skyrim. But unlike most mods which unofficially and therefore harmlessly add Thomas the Tank Engines, this officially sanctioned tweak once installed caused the gabbling space core that got sucked into space at the end of Portal 2 to crash back down to terra firma in Skyrim. Oh, legal, legal. Here come, here come space caps. Here come space caps. Once picked up, the space core can be examined in your inventory, where it will yammer insistently about space like a drunk friend trying to explain a moon landing conspiracy they found online. Oh, 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 I know, I know, I know, wait, 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 I know, wait, I know, I know, wait, space. Annoying, but hey, if that AI core is really doing your head in, you can always hollow it out and turn it into a war helmet. Yeah. Try landing an Animal Crossing next time, Motormouth. You could call the Mario Kart series a lot of things. Colourful, exciting, friendship ruiningly unfair. But the one word you'd never apply to this long-running racer is realistic. Because A, no engine can handle a full mid-race underwater section. B, it's inadvisable to hold a tournament in a functioning airport. And C, no governing body would let an ape compete in a serious racing league. <laughs> Although we live in hope. Come on, Federation Internationale de l'Automobile, do the right thing. The comfortable weirdness of Mario Kart was shattered, however, back in 2014, when Mercedes drove what was presumably a truckload of money up to Nintendo HQ in exchange for having its cars included in Mario Kart 8. <laughs> The vehicles in this car-flavoured cameo comprise the W25 Silver Arrow Racer, the 300 SL Roadster and the Mercedes GLA, which off the top of our head we would probably describe as a front-engine, rear-drive, five-door, sub-compact luxury crossover SUV automobile. Was that from Wikipedia? <laughs> what? How dare... Yes. So those are some of the cameos and games that had us just going, why do you hate the canon so much. Games, why are you just sh shattering it, breaking it like an egg, like the egg of our minds into the omelette of despair? Why? Just, just let everyone stay in their own games and it will make sense. That's what we want. <laughs> but can you think of any other cameos in games? <laughs> sorry, sorry, I lost it. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. Can you think of any others that were, that were bad? All good? Let us know in the comments. Here's some other stuff. That's good. And, uh, oh, oh, I mean, I mean, you're definitely gonna now. 